Next up, we are lucky to have Dr. Ray Crandall. Um, she will be presenting on bunchgrass ecology and southeastern pine savannas. Assistant Professor of Fire Ecology at University of Florida. And Dr. Crandall has been <clears throat> lighting and studying the effects of prescribed fires for nearly 30 years. Her fire ecology lab at the University of Florida examines the role of bunchgrass in promoting fire fuel feedbacks and increasing plant diversity. When she is not teaching classes and measuring wire grass, Dr. Crandall writes a blog about her field observations. Thank you for joining us today. Okay, good morning, everyone. I'm delighted to be here. Lots of old friends and hopefully a lot of new friends. So just to give you a little introduction about myself, um, I've been burning for a long time. I realized in the introduction that I wrote, I kind of dated myself, but started burning as an undergraduate at Butler University in Indianapolis, Indiana, a place where you don't see a, typically see a whole lot of fire. So I didn't get a lot of exposure when I was young um, to burning and to fire, but I caught the fire bug, my very first fire with the Nature Conservancy, and that was the end of it. And I haven't missed a fire season since. I moved out west as soon as I graduated with my bachelor's degree, and I worked on a hand crew for a year, and then I was on an engine crew. I loved that experience. I loved being out on fires. I loved the connection to my crew and all of that, but I really had a passion for teaching and it was really important to me to pass on that passion for fire and to teach others about fire and the role of fire and regeneration of plants. So after a couple of years out West, I went back to college to get my master's and then my PhD got my PhD at Louisiana State, which I should announce in this room, um, but then did most of my research in Florida. So I've been here in Florida for quite a few years and was delighted to get a position at University of Florida where I could just continue to teach about fire. I teach the fire ecology and management lecture and lab at the University of Florida, take students out burning every Friday um, during the spring semester, teach the S13190 at the university there, and also just expose students to the ecological effects of fire, take them out and show them what first got me super interested in fire, and that is watching the regeneration, watching plants begin to bloom after fire, watch the pollinators come in to those blooms. And so my passion is really for teaching about fire and the effects of fire, but then also in restoration and trying to make restoration practices more efficient and effective. So today I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about that aspect and discuss bunch grasses. So I'm showing you here, of course, a longleaf pine savanna and the understory are primarily bunch grasses. This is taken more during a, the dormant season. So many of the bunch grasses have already flowered and they're sort of in a, a brown state there. These bunch grasses are really important for the ecology of pine savannas because they connect the fuels. They kind of have that arching um, architecture that connects one fuel to the next and spreads fire through the understory. And you can see this as they move through other grasses in here also. And what would a fire talk be without at least one video of fire, right? Uh, we know that bunch grasses are very flammable. Their biomass is related a lot to their the fire behavior that they create. The, um, the fire intensity, temperature of the fire is related to the architecture and the biomass of bunch grasses. We also know that these bunch grasses maintain a fuel fire feedback. So when you burn, you're promoting the regeneration of these grasses. And those grasses then provide the fuel and the continuity in fuels then for the next fire, that cycle starts over again. So we say that they maintain this fuel fire cycle. 
A lot of what we see in the understory, particularly in this region, is Aristobrachiana wiregrass. This is going to be the main protagonist of the talk that I give today. My lab's been researching wiregrass for about six years now. Um, there's also a postdoctoral researcher in my lab, Jennifer Phil, whom many of you may know. She has been researching wiregrass for much longer than I have. So between us, um, we've really developed a lot of research to inform the restoration and the management of sites that are dominated by wiregrass. Now, some of you may call it uh, Aristida stricta. There's Aristida stricta and Aristida brachiana. Aristida stricta is now recognized as being further north um, in the Carolinas. And here we have Aristida brachiana. Most of our research sites are near the University of Florida, simply because we have so many undergraduates involved in our research and it's easier to have them go to local sites. We've had a lot of people doing uh, graduate students um, and undergraduates doing research on wiregrass. One of those is Tyler Carney. Uh, some of you may have actually been interviewed by uh, Tyler. He was really interested in the informal economy of wiregrass and the fact that a lot of uh, land managers will trade for wiregrass. So if I can collect wiregrass you know, on your property, I'll loan you the use of equipment. But what also came out of his research is that we still have a lot of uncertainty when we are restoring and managing with wiregrass. Some of those that we're really focusing on are things like, where do we source our seeds? How far can we go to get seeds if we're going to plant seeds in restoration for wiregrass? And what is the quality of those seeds? What are the best ways or are there easy ways to test for the quality of those seeds? It's one thing if you have a ton of seeds, but what if they don't germinate, right? What sowing density should we use? We started looking in the literature and wow, it's all over the place. We started asking people and it's all over the place. So it, they're really, it's like, if I planted this one density and it works one year, I'm just gonna keep doing it. Or I have this certain amount of seed and I have a certain amount of land and that's gonna dictate the seeding rate that I use. So we wanted to determine, well, you know, how much does it really, how much does seeding rate really matter? How much does site prep matter? You know, what should we do, be doing and to what level? So a lot of his research and a lot of the answers that land managers gave to his interviews guides some of our research. We also do co-production of research. We work directly with um, land managers in developing all of our questions. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what we know uh, about wiregrass. I'm not gonna show you a lot of graphs. Um, I'm gonna mainly just tell you about wiregrass. So this is one of the few that you'll see. We um, had an undergraduate student, um, Susanna, who was really interested in whether wiregrass truly had a dormant season or does it grow all year round. So we started measuring wiregrass about two weeks after a fire during the summer and a two weeks after a fire during the winter. And we found that whether you burn during either season, it grows, just keeps on growing. To reach its maximum height, it does that a little earlier after summer burns than it does after winter burns. Um, you may wonder why it doesn't quite get as tall after summer burns. That's because it's a site that burns every year. We think it might have had slightly lower um, carbohydrates. But either way, wiregrass grows all year round. Um, we also did a study where we looked at a long unburned site. One of our undergraduates was like kicking around, you know, you do, you go out in the field and um, was like, wow, there's, there's wire grass underneath all of this litter. It's kind of persisting. It's barely there. It's just a couple of little green leaves and that's it. And so we wanted to see what would happen if we burned it after it hadn't been burned for a really long time. So we marked those uh, plants and we measured them. We also did some manipulations. We increased some of the litter and, and the fuels that were on some of these to see if that would make a difference. And we burned them and we found that they did really well. So with 30 years without fire, these wiregrass persisted even when we added fuels to them, 
which were dried pine cones, um, they did just fine and in fact flowered. So it's good news for wiregrass in these long unburned sites. We also found that not only did they flower, they produced good quality seeds. So we germinated the seeds and they, they did just fine. We found that seed production varies with fire frequency. So we sampled seeds that were in sites that were burned every three years and also in a site that's burned every single year and has been burned every single year since the 1970s. The seeds from sites that were burned every single year were, they were literally like dust. They didn't germinate. So we found from the study that you have to leave at least one year between burning um, to get seed production in wiregrass. Wiregrass is also sensitive to the season during which you burn. If you burn during the winter or like January, you're gonna get very few plants that produce flowering culms, flowering stalks. And those seeds are very, very unlikely to germinate, even if it does produce seeds. If you burn during um, the spring or March, you'll get lots of plants that are producing flowering culms, but very few of those seeds will germinate. So it's kind of like an optical illusion. You're like, oh, I got all these seeds, but very few of them germinate. Whereas if you burn during the summer or June, you get slightly fewer flowering culms than during the spring or March, but more of them germinate. So that's the best time to burn. We already sort of knew this, but wanted to gather more information on it. Also want to acknowledge that this came out of Mary Neil Armstrong's uh, master's thesis. So how do we determine whether we have good quality seeds? So you collect your seeds, and you want to germinate them, it might take months, right? There is a press test that you can use to determine the quality of seeds. Um, you take basically tweezers, it's called the press test, and you can gently press on the seeds. If they're kind of floppy when you press on them, then it's a very low likelihood they're going to germinate, but if they're fairly rigid, then they will. They look the same whether they're high or low quality, so you actually have to test them. You can send them off to the USDA seed testing lab and have them x-rayed, takes a bit of time, not too expensive, but does take a bit of time, or you can do that press test yourself. We're about to post a video of the instructions on how to do this on our blog, uh, and I'll give you a link to that in a few minutes. So we've also done study to look at how canopy openness affects wiregrass and wiregrass um, uh, seed production. And we've found that more plants flower under partial canopy and especially after those summer burns. So having just a little bit of shade really helps them produce more seed. Now this is slightly operationally difficult because you know, if you're using a flail vac to collect seeds, you're not going to want to be driving through a whole lot of trees. But um, interesting information if you're trying to maximize seed production, but maybe you're not as interested in collecting or you're hand collecting. Okay. Um, we were also interested in whether these um, seeds could self or whether they needed to be outcrossed. So this kind of answers the question about genetic diversity within wiregrass. Uh, what we found is that we get the most number of seeds that are able to germinate when they are either hand pollinated or they're open to wind pollination. So with hand pollination, we use little paintbrushes and we kind of went from plant to plant to plant and moved the pollen around. For the selfing treatment, we put bags over them so that they couldn't get any pollen from the wind, um, or sometimes beetles uh, can kind of crawl around and pollinate these. So we do know that they need pollen to move around through the system. And if they're only a singular plant, then they're not going to produce good seeds. They still produced seeds, even when they selfed, they just didn't germinate. We also tested this in a site that was burned annually for the last, what, 40, 50 years, or every three years for the last 50 years. 
And I showed you that previous um, slide that indicates that if you burn every single year, you're going to get lower seed production. We see that here also in this graph. So I like to make the point uh, when I give presentations that yes, I'm an academic. Yes, I'm a professor at University of Florida, but I am out there doing restoration. I'm not just you know, sitting in the ivory tower, unaware of the challenges that go into restoration. Uh, we have a plot of land that we restored a couple of years ago, starting with St. John's uh, River Water Management District, working with Chris Kinslow and others. And I mean, we took it from root raking to, you know, herbiciding, plowing, planting, I have to say it's the hardest thing I have ever done. And it wasn't just the work of being out there and doing it. It was the decision-making, you know, it, are we doing the right thing? Are they going to germinate? Are they going to grow? Is it going to be restored? Um, you know, getting the contracts, um, every step of it along the way, you know, we did, we were out there every day checking on it. Um, we're still out there every day checking on it. And so we have been very involved in this restoration. One of the things that I actually love most is when we have folks that are doing this restoration with wiregrass or any species, and they come to us and they say, hey, I tried this and it really worked. We want to hear about it. And we want to invite those folks to come present on our blog or talk to us about it. We want to come see your site and learn more about what you're doing um, or do research with you and learn more about what you've done and why it has worked. Because we're trying to spread the information that we have and trying to make restoration with wiregrass and other species, as I said, more effective, um, more efficient. We've learned a few other things just in our own little restoration plot. Uh, first, young plants produce really highly germinable seeds. They germinate in the first year, even without fire. Uh, normally, we know that we need to burn in late May, early June to really get a good crop of wiregrass seed um, that germinates. But in fact, they will germinate in that very first year. And the best time to collect seed for restoration is after that first fire. So you can plant them and then two years later, you wanna have your first burn. Seeds are really great after that burn. Uh, wiregrass also, um, instead of seeds can produce uh, pickles. Don't be alarmed if you see pickles. This is actually a smut. Uh, we just named this a couple of years ago, um, and we've done a bit of research on it. We have found that fire season slightly affects the production of this smut, but it doesn't do any harm to the wiregrass. You might notice wiregrass sometimes will have these little uh, brown splotches on it, and that's that the smut has infected the wiregrass, but it doesn't do any harm to it. You're still going to get lots of seeds. We haven't found any instances where the entire plant is infected. I just like to let people know because sometimes we do get these messages that are like, why is my wiregrass producing pickles? Um, it's a smut and it's, it's fine. Uh, I also want to point out there are other bunch grasses um, and some folks have used another one, including Piney Woods drop seed, Sprobulus juncea for restoration. This one is found in slightly drier sites. You will find it in the Music Flatwoods, but it's mostly in those more xeric sand hills. It looks so much like um, wire grass when it's not flowering. It's really hard to tell it apart. You have to look at for hairs at the base of the combs to tell them apart. But when they're flowering, they're much easier to tell apart. Um, we actually study both of them and have compared both of them in multiple studies. Um, yeah, my, uh, my postdoc created this, uh, a little fake Facebook page, um, with drop seed calling wiregrass a, a copycat because they look so much alike. A lot of times people walk around and they're like, look at all this wiregrass, but half of it is actually drop seed. 
Uh, just this last month, we had a paper published showing that drop seed and wiregrass are actually associated with different species. So if you do incorporate multiple bunch grasses in your restoration, um, you have the potential for encouraging more species uh, because they just associate with different species. So we're testing this a little bit further, but you may, um, it may be possible to sort of maximize the species richness by planting multiple bunch grasses. Uh, we've also found they're all very stable, uh, burning during different seasons, different intensities. Um, we've been studying wiregrass populations for quite a while, and it's very rare that a wiregrass plant will die. Um, they're just super stable over time. We have learned that seed sourcing is important and that wiregrass really does know its soil. So if you move it from a, um, so we did a study, start there, where we took mesic seeds, planted them in mesic soil, and we took mesic seeds and planted them in xeric soil. We also took xeric seeds, planted them in, in xeric soil, xeric seeds into uh, mesic soil. And we wanted to know how they would grow. We did this in a greenhouse so we could have a more controlled experiment. We also manipulated the soil so we could test some of the mechanisms in whether it was the microbes in the soil or the nutrients. We did not test um, whether or not it was specifically how much they are watered, they all receive the same amount of water, but we were more testing whether it was microbes or nutrients in the soil that might cause differences. The main difference that we found is that when you have dry seeds and you plant them in the soil from a mesic site, it grows less. And you can see that there. We also found that um, dry seeds overall tended to just grow a little bit more. It's kind of interesting. So we're doing more testing on this and we actually have a field trial considering this was done um, in a greenhouse. Our field trial is running now. Uh, but currently we're suggesting that you do wanna be careful about where you source seeds and make sure that they're coming from a similar habitat as to where you are sowing them. So I mentioned that we have our own field and that we've got it started. Uh, many of you know that early stage of restoration where there's lots of dog fennel and such. That's where the current state of our field is in. Um, we have mapped out the field. We're testing um, seed sourcing. So we have mesic and xeric seeds that have been planted in um, mesic and xeric, so wet and dry areas and testing the soil moisture. We are starting an experiment this year where we're testing soil inoculum. And so you can imagine what the soil goes through when you're preparing it for planting. We're root raking, we're tilling, we're herbiciding, we're tilling again, we're planting. So it really degrades the soil. We're, so we're testing a soil inoculum that we've developed in the lab. Uh, it was extremely easy to create. It's something that you could do on the windowsill of your office. And it doesn't take much inoculum to put out into the field to potentially jumpstart restoration. We're still testing it, but hopefully um, I'll have more information on that soon. We're also testing um, seeding density. So we, we seeded at 10 pounds per acre, uh, 15 pounds per acre, and 25 pounds per acre to see what differences that made. We're also testing competition with other plants. We've gotten really interesting results off of that so far. When you remove competition during early restoration, the wiregrass, wow, they're huge. You would think that they were like 10 year old plants. They're like this. And we just planted them in February, seeds in February. Um, the, we had the first germinates um, in April, April 1st. So since April 1st, these plants are huge. Uh, I made my technicians go out back out and remeasure them because I was like, this isn't right. You've missed a decimal point somewhere. The plants can't get this big in such a short amount of time. But in fact, without competition, they do. Okay. 
Um, so in my last couple of minutes, I just want to point you to our Wiregrass blog. We invite guest um, posts to this blog. It's at ecologyonfire.com. If you just remember that, you can navigate to our blog. We have a lot of really fun things that are up. We're gonna have that press test up soon if you wanna do um, Wiregrass seed testing on your own. And we also just share the things that we learn. We also summarize papers, older papers and papers as they come out on Wiregrass. I know there's often a paywall on papers. We're trying to remove that by summarizing them in this blog. Uh, and then just the things that we learned, we found a new, slightly dangerous method of removing um, wiregrass seeds from combs by using a box fan where we removed the safety. So I feel have to read the blog, but we have a video and everything. So um, I tested first, I put my finger in the fan and it was, didn't hurt. So we proceeded, um, but it worked really well. Okay. Uh, and with that, I think I'm right on time and I'm happy to take any questions. Lots of people to acknowledge. I mean, there's even more than this. So many people have been working on Wiregrass. All right. Thank you, Ray. Mm -hmm. So the day before Ray, we kindly repeat the question for the online audience. Raise your hand if you have a question. Just further than that. Uh, I have Absolutely. Yeah. And in fact, we had a choice of several areas to restore, and admittedly, we chose not to use. So the question is if you have a field of bahia grass, would you herbicide first? And the answer is absolutely yes. Once you have the wire grass planted, it is hard to control the bahia grass. Um, in addition, bahia grass competes really well um, with bunch grasses. I have another project that I've been working on with orchids and bahia grass. I can also tell you like burning bahia grass is so happy afterwards and you wanna be able to burn your wire grass, you absolutely have to get rid of the bahia grass and it's hard to get rid of. Yeah. I have a second question. But like, is there a time of year? Is there a time of year? Uh, that's a good question. I'm not aware of where that is in the literature, but I think most people plant them during the cooler season. I'm not sure if there's science behind that, but I'd be really interested in testing that. So uh, I don't know if there's a is appropriate season to test wire grass, but you've just given us a new research project. Thank you. Real quick, let's do one online question. Okay. Basal areas, if you determine was most effective for the partial canopy, I guess that question where you're saying it does better under partial canopy than you know, open canopy. Could you repeat? Yeah. That? Okay. Yeah, I remember to repeat. Sorry. Um, so the question is for seed production, what range of size of wire of wire grass is best? Basal area of trees. Um, okay, that's that's in our paper. And if you give me that person's contact information, I can get back to you on that. Yeah. Oh, uh, well, okay. That's the, yes. <laughs> oh. Do you have a favorite method of controlling these competing species after you put the seeds in? So do we have a favorite method of controlling the competing species? Admittedly, our current way of controlling the species is by clipping them, which is not something you can do on large scale, I admit. Um, but we wanted to know, you know, is something like cutting, you know, is there a, a method? Um, could we scale this up? So I think that's our next thing is, of course, you're not going to be out there on your hands and knees clipping competing species on acres. We have smaller plots. So we need to figure out how we might be able to scale this up. 
Yeah, good question. Okay, so um, in answer to your question over there about what season, I uh, contact uh, the Atlantic Oil Lobster and Greens Preserve. They've been doing um, plugs in highly erodible areas for decades. So they would know what has worked for them over time. So that that still be Dave Bridges. Yeah, he's still there. Yeah, we'll get to the content. Let's go to an online question. Uh, how many feeds per pound per wire graph? Yeah, so the question is, how many seeds per pound for wire grass? And wow, we really struggled with this one. Um, so it's going to depend on how much uh, chafe you have in your collection. So a lot of times you just, you get a lot of the extra stuff, you know, when you're out there with the flow vac and you're collecting seeds. So it really depends on how clean your seed is. Um, but it's, it's not so much how much seed do you have per pound? It's how much quality seed do you have? So you really have to take an allotment of seeds from your, you know, whatever you've collected and do that press test or send it off to the USDA lab to have an x-rayed or something in order to determine, you know, the quality of those seeds. So you could have X number of seeds per pound, but if in two lots of seeds, but if one lot has 20% germinable seeds, but the other one has 80% germinable seeds, there's a big difference there. Okay, so a question from this side. Yes. Have you done any work on figuring out how long wire grass seeds are before it dry storage? Okay, so the question is, have I done any work in how long wire grass seeds are good in dry storage? Um, yes. So I will tell you our preliminary results, but please don't take this as set in stone. Uh, we are working with um, Hector Perez, who's in horticulture at University of Florida, he has been working on doing some stress tests with seeds. And we, so we collected seeds from two different sites uh, around Thanksgiving, slightly after, um, during 2021, and started doing immediate germination tests. And by, I would say it was May or June, what we were seeing is that the seeds would still produce the hypocotyl, which is the, the stuff, the leaf that comes out of the seed, right? So there's the leaf that comes out and the root that comes out. The leaf would still come out, but the root wouldn't come out. So, you know, as of about six months after collection, the seeds they still appeared filled. They still appeared to germinate, but the root wouldn't, the root didn't emerge from the seed. Yeah. We are testing that again this year before we're like saying, going to say anything definitive. But this side. So Chris, uh, oh, and then we'll get back to the final model. I was intrigued to hear about your soil inoculum. I was mm -hmm. curious what constitutes that. Is it uh, going to be like a mix of anaerobic and aerobic bacteria? Or are you producing some of the nematodes? Yeah, so we're mainly working with mycorrhizal fungi, and we're using soil that's in an area that's considered um, like a reference site. And all you do to create that inoculum, and we're still in our inoculum creation stage, so we still need to test it and see everything that's in it. But to create an inoculum, you basically take that soil from your reference site and you grow corn in it. And we think that's going to be enough, you know, to inoculate soil. Now, is that going to enhance fire grass? Um, growth or establishment. We don't know. We haven't tested that yet. So that's kind of, that's on the frontier, right, of what we're doing. 
Oh, yeah, not like question. Is there cross germination between the different wire grasses and bunch grasses since they are so close uh, in relationship and relative to the grass? Okay, so do bunch grasses, so sporobolus in a wrist, so do bunch grasses in a reed, do they cross? Um, that's a really good question. Sporobolus and Aristida, no, but do species of Aristida, I don't think we have um, information on that. At least I haven't seen it in the literature. Okay, yeah, pumping back to the seeds per pound thing, um, the Disney Wilderness Preserve uh, did seed assay work uh, during the first decade of the 2000s in conjunction with work at State University. We found that there was a wide range of seeds per pound in sorted seed, not, not mix and bulk, trashy mix and stuff like that. But if we took pure seed that was sorted out, we had a range of about 750,000 to about 1.1 million seeds per pound. Any Thank other you. questions from the audience here? Let me online. Okay. One more. <laughs> Is there currently anyone you know collaborate uh, you know, collaborate with the working on a master's thesis or study involving understory oak controlling blue jacks? Sand live upland rural uh, in upland sandhill ecosystem using the or central north central area. Oh my gosh, I don't know if I can repeat all that. <laughs> um, do I know of anyone who is using herbicide treatments to control oaks in uplands or mechanical? Um, that like a master's student or whatnot, that might be a Heather Alexander question. She's in Mississippi. I don't know of anyone offhand. I'd have to give it a thought. All right, so what we'll do is we'll wrap it up. So uh, everyone get ready to handle.